You know, I've been browsing the subreddit for a while, and I never thought to look for D&D horror stories in it, but dang, there are some doozers. Welcome to Are the Straits Okay? You play D&D, so you must be on the smart end of the IQ curve. Here's the problem. The IQ curve for men is wider, meaning the higher your IQ, the less women there are. For example, for every two men with an IQ over 130, there will be one woman with an IQ over 130. This is reducing your dating pool significantly, especially when you take into account that 150th people... 150th people... Don't think the grammar checks out there. That one fiftieth of people in the world have an IQ over 130. That means that one in 100 women are on your IQ level. And it's not even sure if she has interest in some of your hobbies. First and foremost, I'm pretty sure he's trying to assert that men are smarter on average. But that would make the curve thinner, not wider? Because the standard deviation would be lower. At least I think so. I'm really only moonlighting as a nerd. Also, playing D&D definitely does not make you smart. Have you seen some of the questions that D&D players ask? Uh, how does sneak attack work? Are you a rogue? Isn't that your main ability? I know, but how am I supposed to remember? It's almost like I should have a character sheet or something. Uh, seriously, it's such BS. This spell does nothing on a successful save. Are you sure? I mean, save or suck on third level. No, it's completely save or suck. It's just so stupid. A few moments later. Oh, says half damage, dude. Seriously? Look, I'm, I don't, I didn't know you were supposed to like read the whole spell. It's like five sentences. That's too much for me. Uh, my calculator is not working again. What's seven plus five? It's fourteen. Thanks. Fifteen points of damage. I was invited to a homebrew Star Wars Jedi Academy kind of game, Run in Fate. Fate is a genre-neutral, rules-light narrative game with a few published settings because it's made to be easy just to do whatever. There's a lot of things it doesn't have, like a dark side or a alignment mechanic. You're supposed to be true to whatever character you came up with, so there's not a lot compared to games like D&D or Pathfinder. We had to come up with backgrounds of how we came into some power and been subsequently discovered and recommend to be sent to school for training and a montage of our trip to the school on Tatooine because for some reason, every Star Wars game has to spend some time on Tatooine. <laughs> Sometimes it feels like every Star Wars anything has to spend some time on Tatooine. I'm not even a huge Star Wars fan, and I've really started to notice. I don't know why the only reason the place was in the movie to begin with was because it was basically Space Wyoming, a complete nowhere off the beaten track. Oh man, that's brutal. I really feel bad for the, uh, uh, to the, oh, there it is. Our 10 viewers in Wyoming. Oh my god. If you're in Wyoming right now watching this video, you are the few but the proud. My character, as I pitched the party and Game Master, and which they approved, had started out as a priestess of death on a colony world. Not a priestess of causing death, mind you, just a priestess of a sect that dealt with last rites, mortuary services, comforting the be- the b b bereaved b bereaved Oh, God. And maintaining that world's graveyards. She believed that everyone had a destiny. I haven't played in so long, you could tell I'm suffering from withdrawals. She wanted people to live out their lives freely and productively before they came into her sex's inevitable care, hopefully at a ripe old age, surrounded by loved ones. She didn't even want to hurt her enemies if she could help it. As such, she was built as a protector, something of a pacifist, and with aspects themed around things like stillness. The game started and everything seemed to be going fine. Then, we got to a point where we could allocate more abilities. I wanted to lean into the pacifist theme of the character, and proposed to add a stunt to make it easier for me to create aspects to drain or disable technological devices, debuffing enemies by killing their batteries so they could be dealt with in a non-lethal manner. It seemed like it fit well with the character, and it was a good way to be more of a pacifist. The game master disappeared for a few days without saying a word. As I discovered later, they had gone searching through their collection of source books and novels? N no- Whoa! Novels. I know how to pronounce novel, I swear. In them, they found a somewhat similar ability in an obscure source book. I returned to Gondor to uncover the ancient text, the account of Isildur. Oh, thank God, this is gonna be perfect for my Star Wars game. 
not mind you from the game system we were playing or even a version of a Star Wars game that we were playing that wasn't Fate. No, once upon a time, a Star Wars RPG had once been published in a completely different form by completely different publishers, which I think went out of business a long time ago, and that game had more than one edition. They found it in an older version, not even the latest edition of the ancient out-of-print game. In it, some obscure character, maybe from an old comic book, I don't know, had once used a power similar to that, and in that book, it was defined as a dark side ability. I don't know why, it was never explained to me, I didn't even get the name of the character that did it, and I've never seen or played that version of this Star Wars RPG. Suddenly, the Game Master reappeared in the chat in a full-blown temper tantrum, furiously lecturing us on how I was trying to sneak in an evil character. He accused me of trying to disrupt his game with my inevitable and intentional descent into evil and darkness. Okay, so I was thinking of ideas for my new player character. I was hoping that she could be some kind of like dark priest who went through some trauma as a child and is using that, channeling that energy to help the people around her using black magic to combat evil creatures. Could be a lot of fun. Dude, that sounds sick. <laughs> yeah, I'm really excited. To yeah, sorry, that character's a no-go. Why? Are you kidding me? Look. I don't allow evil characters. I made that very clear. What what about her is evil? Like, she's trying to help people and protect them from evil monsters. I mean, she seems pretty cool to me. Well, she uses dark magic, automatic evil, and she wears black. I mean, come on, what good guy wears black? Everyone who wears black is evil, clearly. Uh, look in the mirror recently? No, wait. Feel stupid. That's, that's mm -hmm. impossible. That's just dumb, man. What, what, yeah. if, I, what yeah. if I become? Yeah, that's what I thought. Yeah. No. Wait, what did no! Without allowing any discussion, he chose to cancel the entire game, blaming me for trying to ruin the game for everyone. These, on top of two ridiculous arguments about canon in a Star Trek game, where we weren't even trying to go close to anything from the shows, and an argument about comic book continuity in a superhero game where none of the characters relate to any published characters, ended my willingness to play or game master in any published setting or existing intellectual property under any circumstances ever. No discussion. It's limited my ability to find a game ever since, and often relegates me to the role of forever game master which I'm usually okay with. Still, I sometimes longingly look upon games people set up in published settings, and I wish I wasn't so on edge and suspicious of the inevitable toxicity that I've seen too much of to feel comfortable playing in them. Ah, uh, you've heard the rules, lawyer. Let me introduce you to the lore lawyer. This is something that I encounter most in other fandoms, not necessarily Dungeons & Dragons, since homebrew is such a common thing here. I find that a lot of people don't go all lore lawyer whenever they see something that disagrees with the established canon, because, again, D&D has so much creative freedom when it comes to world building. However, yeah, in other fandoms, this kind of thing is very common. In Star Wars, it gets pretty ridiculous sometimes, which is why I'm not a huge Star Wars fan, and I really only engage in the Lego. Look, if you want to stick to the established canon, that's awesome, but make sure that your group are aware of that. And frankly, no matter what kind of established canon you want to stick to, please don't freak out at people over stuff like this. It's, uh, it's lame. Sorry, I just don't know how else to say it. I play Cyberpunk Red. I've had an online campaign running for about 10 months now. It's a solid group, sure, and we have an occasional hiccup, but nothing worthy of this subreddit until now. The Cyberpunk Red rulebook does not have real rules to dictate carry weight. Well, let me tell you, the Cyberpunk video game does! Do you know how much of a pain it is to manage your inventory with a controller? I'm the most powerful merc in all of Night City. You'd think I'd be able to hold a little bit more- Ugh, never mind. Anyway, look, the rule book does not dictate carry weight or how many items someone can carry with them at a time. It just relies on the rule of common sense. I relied on that as well and just kind of hand wave checking for inventory a lot of the time. I don't like to get bogged down in micromanaging my players. I just want to get into playing. But there were a few moments where my player characters brought or wore items that just don't make sense to where they're going and narratively didn't feel like it worked. Stuff like wearing police issued armor to a casual outing at a gang's dive bar or bringing an assault rifle to a carnival performance. 
I also want to encourage my players to think strategically about their carried inventories and not be able to pull rabbits out of their hats at a moment's notice. I tried to put together an inventory management homebrew, but the player this post is about immediately started looking for ways to exploit the proposed rules so he could still carry 30 plus items. Oh, hey, by the way, was looking on DM Academy, saw some great ideas that inspired some encumbrance rules in my head. I was hoping we can test them out, you know, see if they mesh with the party and... Uh, you're, you're, you're giving me a look. I can't allow this to happen. The DM's who cannot take away my infinite inventory. There must be a way to overcome this. I will search every book, every ancient tome. I will uncover the truth. And this Dungeon Master will be broken before my feet. Just you watch Dungeon Master. I'll look through the DM's guide myself. And then I'll take a potato, I mean pretzel, and eat it. I'm just gonna go. It was completely against the spirit of what I was trying to accomplish. I decided to scrap what I originally proposed and said I was just going to do some thinking about how to change it, but essentially the goal is for people to be able to bring closer to a dozen items instead of 30 plus. I said I need to think about a simple, fair way to accomplish what I was trying to accomplish and that I'd encourage everyone's feedback so that we could have something that everyone was happy with. Two of the players approved of having something in place as they like to plan strategy. Player 3 started to have a meltdown. He said it completely undermines and nerfs his character to have an inventory limit of any kind. He said he built his character around having a lot of items and it ruins it for him. I said there needs to be some kind of limit as no one should have infinite items carried with them. Player 2 asked 3 what he thought was a reasonable and fair amount of items to carry. I also asked the same guy, player 3, how many items he actually used in the last few sessions because it was nowhere near 30. Player 3 refused the notion of having an inventory limit and argued both in group chat and started blowing up in my messages saying he would leave the group if I imposed this kind of system in any way. No matter what it was, he would not agree with it and it is non-negotiable and I'm realizing now that my earlier rant kind of sounds like this guy and I am sorry. <laughs> He said that if I do this, I need to make his character stronger by making drugs. It's time to cook, DM. It's time to cook. Sorry, by making drugs more powerful and changing his gas jet weapon to use handgun instead of shoulder arm skill. I said if he wants to make a more powerful drug or make upgrades to the gas jets, he needs to consult with our tech player to propose some kind of invention. There's an entire role dedicated to making upgrades and modifying items. I'm not going to do that for free. I ended up saying that I was suspending any kind of inventory management homebrew for now and that I would only implement something if everyone agreed it was fair. Player 3 refused this also. So, since I still want to implement something at some point, and just decided to quit the campaign. <laughs> Quite frankly, the ultimatums, the tantrum, and the entitlement soured me to him as a player, and to be honest, as a person as well. He started asking about doing a send-off for his character in-game, which I have responded to, as I'm frustrated and disgusted by his attitude. Wait, hold on, doing a send-off? <laughs> Dungeon Master, we meet again at last. Joke's on you. We met literally last week! Shut up! You will pay for your crimes against me, and your awful DMing. You are a big, stupid dummy. And at last, I have slain you. What are you waiting for? Finish it off. First. Can you write an epilogue for my character? Wait, what? Yeah, yeah, I, I had some ideas for like how we could set up my character in, in your campaign. You know, before, you know, I, I spit on your corpse and I shoot you and all that. Dude, why would I do that? <gasps> no, seriously, why would I do that? You've treated me like crap. You apparently don't like my game. You wanted to leave. Now you're trying to murder me. Why would I ever write an epilogue for your character? <laughs> no. Wait. Dude. What? How? Dude. Wait, why not? It doesn't make any Seriously? sense! I'm just, gonna, I'm just gonna go. I'm just gonna get out of here. Yeah, that's annoying and- Oh! Look at that! We have an update. 
Thank you all for your insights. I have a small update about the situation. I told the player that I will not be doing any send-off sessions for the character. I told him he chose to leave because he wanted to metagame and was focused on winning instead of telling a story. I also said that I did not appreciate being given ultimatums and being told, run the game I want or I am leaving. So that's it. It's done. He told me, quick correction, the main reason I'm leaving is because of the time zone differences slash unhealthy hours. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. And he said he wasn't trying to be a power gamer, but it was more about the fun to him. This actually made me even more irritated because I don't believe he can in good faith say he would have quit the game yesterday if the topic of inventory management had never come up. When we were discussing the issue in DMs yesterday, he eventually got to the point where he said, I can't be bothered with this anymore. I'll leave the campaign. And then he made a long post to the group chat that he was leaving and he gave inventory management and his spiel about it as the number one reason as to why. I hesitate to use the term, but it did feel like he was trying to gaslight me about what happened in that moment in some attempt to placate me and make me feel like the circumstances around him leaving the game were more acceptable somehow. It certainly had the opposite effect. Yeah, I agree with this DM. Forcing your players to micromanage your inventory isn't great. I think it's more of a pain for the DM, to be honest. I do not understand dungeon masters who are so almost religiously gun-ho about encumbrance rules and how varied encumbrance is the best thing and how they never play a game without it. Like, look, if that's fun for you, that's fun for you. But for me, I just don't get it. However, common sense encumbrance, as I like to call it, when a player can have a reasonable amount of items on their person, is the best way to do it, in my opinion, at least for most dungeon masters. This DM was trying to systematize it in some way, and I think that's sensible when players like this are involved. When somebody is actively trying to gamify the encumbrance system, you might want to create some kind of ruling around it. Though, I will say, for most players, it's simply not going to be necessary. However, with this specific player, gamifying it would be a mistake. This guy is actively looking for loopholes and exploits, and being a general jerk about it the whole way through through. It's just not worth it to put your effort into homebrewing something like this if this guy is gonna be such a prick. I've been watching these D&D horror stories for quite some time. I never thought I'd have my own horror story so soon, but here it is. My friends and I have been wanting to play Dungeons & Dragons for about four years now, but never got into it until a few months ago. Our great friend DM was willing to DM for the first time and host the sessions at their house. We had a party of eight people, which slowly whittled down through the sessions. If you know anything about how many players I like having, you'll know I think that's a good thing. This particular session, we had six people participating. DM, Barbarian, Wizard, Warlock, Bard, my boyfriend, Paladin, the Problem Player, and Cleric, me. During this campaign, my boyfriend was playing an alcoholic Bard, and as a fun way to get emerged, I think you mean immersed, but this word's funnier, he thought it would be cool if during sessions, he had a beer to drink. When we went out to go buy some, he got some for our friends as well, hoping everyone could get lightly drunk and we could have some fun. We get to Dungeon Master's house and find that Paladin and Wizard had also decided to buy some alcohol. We take an hour just chatting for a while while people are taking that time to arrive, and during this time, Bard, Wizard, Warlock, and Paladin are drinking. Warlock had been at a family event before the session and had already had a couple drinks in before coming, so he got tipsy quite fast. Our Paladin had this tendency of never being sober, aka a, um, <clears throat> addiction, so she was also high before drinking, quickly becoming cross. We start the session, I immediately can tell, the alcohol, this is a mistake, man. Paladin was zoned out, and Warlock and Wizard were also obviously drunk, constantly interrupting Dungeon Master and derailing the game. Oh boy. Me and my players are definitely taking a little something something while playing D&D. But God, never to this extent. If I had to corral people like this while playing, I think I'd rather just quit progress became incredibly slow because of this. We also kept trying to take the bottle away from Paladin when she continued drinking, but she would make a scene, insisting that she needed the alcohol. The session quickly turned into just me, Bard, and Barbarian going through the story. Wizard, Warlock, and Paladin kept encouraging each other to keep drinking and would interrupt the three of us who were actually trying to play. 
every five minutes or so, Wizard would become conscious again and apologize, saying he didn't understand why he was so drunk, and we would have to explain to him what we were doing in the game. After maybe 15 minutes, Wizard finally decided to tell us he hadn't eaten or drank anything all day, and it was around 7pm at the time. And that was probably the reason why he was drunk. Uh, so yeah, we decided to take a break to order some pizza. At this point, Paladin had fully checked out of the game, and we were basically babysitting her. The whole time, we were extremely worried she was gonna throw up, so we had to keep telling her to drink water. The pizza arrives, and we give her a slice, encouraging her to eat so she can fully absorb some alcohol. She doesn't eat. We finish up our break, and me, Bard, and Barbarian start to play again as the other three screw around, basically. To be fair, Wizard and Warlock were trying to be active members of the game, but they were too inebriated to fully pay attention. The atmosphere is awkward as I try to keep leading the group, and Bard is clearly upset over the drunkenness of our friends. We continue the game and get to our first bit of combat when Paladin suddenly stands from the table and makes her way to the bathroom. The way she stood up concerned me, and I watched her basically stumble down the hallway. As soon as she gets to the bathroom, I hear her retch and the sound of chunks hitting the floor. I tell everyone that I was pretty sure Paladin was throwing up, and we immediately stop playing, which I think you should have done a long time ago. Paladin spends like 10 minutes in the bathroom puking. The door is locked and she won't respond to anyone. She finally comes out and just goes to sit back at the table. We peek into the bathroom and there is vomit everywhere across the floor and the toilet. And when I say everywhere, I, I mean, dude, it was, it was everywhere. Since Paladin stepped on some, there was also vomit tracked out the hole. Ew, my God, ew, dude. Gone, God. That was so foul, I think even I can taste it. Here's the next few things that happen. Bard is so upset and feels responsible for the situation, so he starts to clean up Paladin's vomit. Sometime during the cleanup, he realizes that the toilet is clogged because apparently Paladin had been stuffing something down it. I can't remember what it was. Mm, theorize in the comments. Either way, the toilet was clogged. DM had to ask their parents for the plunger, so at this point, their mother comes down and sees the mess in the hallway and bathroom. Our seventh member, another wizard, who really only came and played on his phone the whole time, finally arrived and just saw the aftermath. <laughs> While Bard is mopping up the bathroom, Paladin is sitting on the table and DM's mom comes to take care of her, offering her electrolytes and water and starts talking with the rest of the party. Mm, you got a good mom right there, I approve. Paladin throws up twice more in their backyard, still refusing to drink any water we give her. Me and Wizard 2 are standing outside with her, trying to encourage her to drink water and also wash away the vomit whenever she throws up. It was night and winter, and I didn't have a jacket, so it was freezing outside. Eventually, Bard finishes cleaning the bathroom and mopping the hallways, and we all go home, very apologetic to the dungeon master and their mom. We made sure to wash all the dishes and clean up the living room before we left too. After the session, Paladin refused to come because she felt embarrassed. When I throw up all over my friend's house. Leave, leave the, the premises completely. That's the only thing that you can do to be a decent human being. A few sessions later, she did end up coming back with a new Artificer character. She was then promptly kicked out of the group after a conversation in Discord voice chat one night where she said she wished she could... What? There were many requests I had for Baldur's Gate 3, many of which Larian has actually added, but I think they should skip this one for patch 7, just my personal opinion. I wish I could say at least she felt apologetic about how she acted that night, but she knew what she was doing. There was never a time when she wasn't in that state, and if she was hanging out with all of us, then she was always cross, which wouldn't be so bad if she wasn't the most dangerous drunk imaginable. She frequently gets speeding tickets driving under the influence. Wait, yo, speeding tickets? Where do you guys live? Driving a little bit over the limit can ruin your life in this state, my god. She'll disappear randomly when she's drunk and force us to go find her, and once at a Halloween party, she took Bard's katana and started swinging it around. It was actually sharp, and she was extremely drunk while she did that. 
It got so bad that if we knew we were going to hang out and there would be alcohol, we just wouldn't invite her. Once we started playing D&D, we had hoped she would be sober for the sessions, and we were wrong. Paladin was always in that state during sessions, very disruptive and disrespectful of the Dungeon Master's things. Their dad played a lot of D&D himself and had a bunch of figures and dice which Paladin would constantly drop or slam against the table. She would also constantly bang her fists on the table and be extremely loud. During one session, she barely loudly asked, oh my god. She asked the DM, is your sister autistic? While said sister was standing like right there. The one good thing about that session though is that things afterward just kept improving. We finished up the campaign at the beginning of the year, ended it with only four consistent players, and now we're one session deep into our water deep campaign with my boyfriend as our dungeon master. The party is full of consistent players, and more importantly, no more paladin. Oh boy, little horror story for you guys. I went to a party where I was drinking, I got drunk, and I slammed the glass I was drinking out of into a table. And that was my friend's favorite wine glass. And I felt really guilty, so I bought her an identical replacement. If I did something like this, I think I would just prefer to never be seen by my friends again. <laughs> Look, I advocate for supporting people through their problems with their addictions. However, you're not a trained counselor, and your friends should not be forcing you into a position where you need to act like one. It is on them to get help and to minimize the damage they do to the people around them. And they are doing damage here. I mean, yeah, this is just a D&D &D game, but there seems to be a lot of problems with this person. A lot of very serious problems. Problems that can land her in jail. I'm not even gonna, like elaborate on the random Baldur's Gate comment at the end. Yeah, that would get someone instantly kicked from my game too. In a way though, I'm glad she said that. If that was the straw that broke the camel's back, I'm glad it was something that, in comparison to her other antics, was innocuous and stupid. Alright, and that's a wrap. If you guys enjoyed, then please do leave a like. If you want to see more of our content, then you can check out our Tabletop Tavern Tips series. We are almost at 100 episodes. So please do let me know if you have any ideas for what we should do for episode 100, because I'm kind of stumped. It's linked in the cards, and while you're there, subscribe to Crispy's Tavern to get more of our content as it comes out. And finally, if you want to leave your own stories or thoughts, go down in the comments down below. If you can't think of a comment, leave the comment. She drank too much to let me know you made it to the end of the video. Hey, by the way, if you have your own horror stories, you can Send them directly to us. There's an email down in the description down below. Send your stories our way for a chance to be featured in one of these videos. But hey, even if you don't have any stories, in essence, like, comment, subscribe. I'll see you all next time. Farewell.